Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Oakland Church. So glad you're here. I was asked to sing a solo at College Church of the Nazarene in Olathe, Kansas. And I was so nervous. I remember just before getting up to sing, I was frantically printing the lyrics off. And, uh, and I ran into Pastor Paul Cunningham, who became a general superintendent, so stressed out and nervous to, to sing in front of, I don't know, a couple thousand people. And then I woke up. I was so relieved. <laughs> and then it hit me. We're not singing for an audience of thousands. We're singing for an audience of one. Amen. Creator of the universe has condescended to our level. He is with us, and we have the privilege of offering our praises to him. So let's offer him the best we have. Amen? It's going to be a great day. So glad you're here. Thank you for joining us on the live stream. I greet you in Christ's name. If you're new among us in this space, I encourage you to fill out this tab on the bulletin. Let us know who you are and the rest of you. There's spaces for prayer requests to, uh, to get more information. And if you're on our live stream, you can go to our website and there's a similar form. We'd love to know you're there. And I have a little gift for our, our first time visitors. A couple quick announcements, uh, if I remember, there they are, the giving option. Most of you are familiar with the four ways to give. It's on the screen. I encourage you to put God first with your money and, and experience the blessings that come from uh, doing things God's way. Meal train. We, we're, we're trying, well, we are committed to providing meals for those who've been hospitalized. The McElroy's just had a baby, so this coming week we're going to provide meals. So I encourage you to, uh, to go to that link. It's in the bulletin. Some of you received the email. There's a card in the physical link. And sign up, take them a meal, be a blessing, something we all can do. And if nothing else, show up with a gift card or a pizza, and uh, I'm sure they'll like that. And uh, the last, well, I think there are two more announcements. Next Sunday, we're having a special kids event. We did two family Sundays in January, so we're not doing any this month. Margaret McKee has planned a special Winter Olympics emphasis for our children next Sunday. And last but not least, uh, Ash Wednesday is a week from this coming Wednesday. It's the start of the Lenten season. It's a great way to prepare our hearts to draw closer to Jesus, so I encourage you to join us for that service. Kobe's going to come at this time and give our call to worship and opening prayer. The call to worship comes from Psalm 63, verses 2 through 5. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. Let's pray as we prepare to worship. Father God, we're so grateful for this opportunity to be in your presence this morning. God, would you fill our lips with praise and would our hearts be filled with joy as we sing uh, these songs to your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. Kobe, because your love is better than life. Amen. Those are great words this morning. Thank you for sharing that. Let's stand together and worship him this morning by, first of all, confessing that Christ has died. Christ is risen. And Christ is coming again. Hallelujah. We praise you this morning, Lord. Nothing is impossible through you. Blind eyes are open. Strongholds are broken. I'm leaving my faith. Nothing is impossible. Yeah, let's testify together this morning.
deep down I know that you're here with me I know that you can do anything Through you I can do anything I can do all things Cause you gives me strength Nothing is impossible Tell him this morning, Father, I believe in you. and You are worthy of our praise this morning. Amen.
lift our hands together and worship this morning. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, and worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, and worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Good to you all the time. Thank you, Lord. Alone in my sorrow, dead in my sin, lost with no hope and no place to move again. But your love made a way to lend mercy. In. When death was arrested, my life began. My ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, but my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, It's your endless love pouring
your grace so free while she's over me you have made me new now life begins with you it's your endless love it's pouring down on us you have made just thank you for a new life uh, this morning, Father. And so we're going to gather together and honor you. And one of the ways that you have allowed us to do is to come to you in prayer. Uh, so the uh, pastor is going to lead us in a time of uh, corporate prayer, but the invitation extends to each of us individually. That is the price that was paid so that we can live in abundance and in accordance with his word. Um, so I encourage you not to let an opportunity go by to uh, beseech him. And that can happen from your seats. It doesn't, you know, there's nothing magical necessarily that happens at the altars, but it's helpful to get out of the routine and the condition that we're in to maybe just walk in and, you know, sit down, stand up, do that a few times and leave. Um, so, yeah, let's take advantage of this opportunity that we have in front of us at this moment to approach the throne. Um, you're welcome to come and kneel at the altar as we sing the chorus one more time. The pastor's going to lead us. Oh, your grace so free while she's over me. You have made me new now life begins with you. And it's your Gracious God, we thank you for freedom. <laughs> As we have uh, enjoyed some of the Olympics, Lord, we were reminded that not everyone enjoys the freedoms we have. There is oppression and persecution in many places, but not here, not now. We're blessed, Lord. May we not forget that. But the greatest freedom has come through Jesus Christ. We've been set free from sin, from fear, and ultimately from death. God, may that reality encourage us today and fill us with thanksgiving and praise. No matter what we're going through, if the Son has set us free, we are free indeed. And we're free to live in love for your glory, Lord. We're not bound to the values of this world. We don't have to chase after the here and now to find meaning and purpose. Again, remind us of who we are in Christ. New creations. The old is gone, Lord. We struggle with that. We often feel bound to old habits and values. You've set us free, but keep setting us free, God. Keep sanctifying us. Keep making, making us more like Jesus so we can live an abundant life, so we can live a missional life, God. Those around us need to see there's a better way. We thank you for your goodness to us, Lord. We have called upon you and you have answered at least four surgeries this past week and they all went pretty well. Thankful that Scott's here today. Just continue to touch him. Continue your healing and Rich Baird and Isaac and Ashley. And just thank you for the technology you've given and the gifts of healing 
be with those who still need your touch today, God. We're praying for complete restoration for Tori in coming weeks. Just encourage him. Lord, be with Janet Cruz's brother, Abdullah, who's made some improvement, but he has a long way to go. God, just spare him. Just touch those who are homesick today. Encourage our people, God, who deal with depression and mental illness, Lord. And help us with our relationships and our finances, God. Show us a better way to live. And when life is hard, may we cling to the promise that you're with us and that better days are coming, if not in this life, in the life to come. God, we continue to pray that you will help us in our mission here to be light in our schools and neighborhoods and workplaces. And use our church plant, Lord, the road that will launch in a few months to help many, particularly those who live around our church, realize that they're loved and that they need you, God. Bless our efforts. Raise up harvest workers, God. And Lord, I just commit this service to you. Uh, it's a it's a challenging text today, and I'm a little too anxious about it, but it's your word, and it's good, and you want to help us, Lord. So we just invite you to speak, God. Open our ears and hearts, Lord. Bless each one who's here, and those listening on the live stream, Lord, and just invade their homes. Make this a holy hour for each one. May they know that they're noticed, that they matter. This is your day, God. We're trusting you for rest and renewal and that you will be glorified and that the kingdom of God will go forth. That's our prayer. Let's pray that familiar Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's your end. This love pouring down on us, you have made us new now, life begins with you, and how great is our God, sing with me how great. Is our God? Oh, sing how great, how great is our God. Let's sing His name above all names. You are the name above all names. Worthy. Your soul will see how great, how great is our God. Amen. A little spontaneity, huh? allowed in church. <laughs> so good to see you all today. 
And it's good to have these moments where we celebrate life and uh, we make some important promises. So at this time, George and Christina are bringing their newborn daughter, Olivia, before the congregation of the Lord to dedicate her. Come on down. You know, about one in three squawks. So don't feel bad, all right? No, you hold her till, till I'm, I'm ready. So I want you to step back a little and I'll get a good look at you. So hear these words of liturgy. Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to play, place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. In presenting this child for dedication, you not only signify your faith in the Christian religion, but also your desire that she may early know and follow the will of God, may live and one day die a Christian, and may come unto everlasting blessedness. In order to attain this holy end, it will be your duty as parents to teach her early the fear of the Lord, to watch over her education that she be not led astray to direct her youthful mind to the Holy Scriptures and her feet to the sanctuary, to restrain her from evil associates and habits, and as much as in you lies, to bring her up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Will you endeavor to do so by the help of God? If so, answer, I will. Amen. Amen. I now ask you, the congregation, will you commit yourselves as the body of Christ to support and encourage these parents as they endeavor to fulfill their responsibilities to this child. And will you do all you can to assist Olivia in her growth toward spiritual maturity? If so, answer, we will. Amen. Amen. Now I get her. <laughs> it's all right. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do marvel at your handiwork. This little one, like everyone, was knit together in her mother's womb. She has been made fearfully and wonderfully in the image of God, and she has already brought such joy to so many. But George and Christina are affirming their desire that she follow Jesus. They acknowledge there's nothing more important, God, and they're committed to doing their part, and we're going to walk alongside them and pray for this precious girl and teach her who you are and how much you love her. But we all need your help, God, so give all that's needed for this awesome task. Reach out to this precious girl early and help her to hear your voice and respond to open her heart up to you and follow Jesus always. So we do dedicate Olivia Sophia Medina to you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. She's doing well. Does she need that binky or not? All right, let's take a stroll. Sing with me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. I can't tell if she looks horrified or not, but uh, you did really well. Did you get a good look at her over there? Too? All right. Well, thanks be to God. 
Guess I'll give her back. Here you go, George. <laughs> All right, and you may congratulate and, wel and uh, welcome this little one into our church family. And you, oh, let me get your certificate, and you guys can take your seat. God bless you. Does she like me better than you, George? No. <laughs> So, what do you want her to be? What are our dreams for our children? And for ourselves, do we want to be affluent, successful, popular, happy, godly, followers of Jesus? Well, those aren't mutually exclusive. But if we don't get first things first, none of that other stuff really matters, right? I think it's important that we kind of let go of our dream, our American dreams, and embrace the, the values of the kingdom of God, because that's the best way to live. We're going to talk this morning about the blessed life. Living with kingdom values, God's values, rather than ours. So turn, if you have a Bible, to Luke chapter 6. We'll be reading verses 17 through 26. Text is on the screen, but it's always good to have your Bible or a Bible with you. We have some in the back if you forgot yours. Would you stand for the reading of the word? Luke 6. We'll begin with verse 17. Just prior, we see uh, Jesus calling the 12 apostles to himself to follow him. When they came, Jesus and his apostles, down from the mountain, the disciples stood with Jesus on a large level area surrounded by many of his followers and by the crowds. There were people from all over Judea and from Jerusalem and from as far north as the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those troubled by evil spirits were healed. Everyone tried to touch him because power, healing power, went out from him, and he healed everyone. Then Jesus turned to his disciples and said, God blesses you who are poor, for the kingdom of God is yours. God blesses you who are hungry now, for you will be satisfied. God blesses you who weep now. For in due time you will laugh. What blessings await you when people, mock, when people hate you and exclude you and mock you and curse you as evil because you follow the Son of Man, title Jesus used of himself. When that happens, be happy. Yes, leap for joy, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, their ancestors treated the ancient prophets the same way. What sorrow awaits you who are rich, for you have, only, you have your only happiness now. What sorrow awaits you who are fat and prosperous now, for a time of awful hunger awaits you. What sorrow awaits you who laugh now, for your laughing will turn to mourning and sorrow. What sorrow awaits you who are praised by the crowds, for the ancestors also praised false prophets. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. We're even thankful for this hard teaching. <laughs> but it started off well. It, it was a good day for the 12, the 12 men Jesus handpicked to be his disciples, the, the men he would mentor. Um, they had just been chosen by Jesus and now they're witnessing amazing things. This crowd of hundreds or thousands is gathering, coming from 50 or 60 miles away. That was a four days journey on donkey back. And they watched Jesus cast out demons and heal the sick and power was just flowing everywhere. And they're right in the middle of it all. Jesus' star is rising, and, and they're going to be a part of that. Because following Jesus leads to mountaintops. 
I hope that, you know, metaphor uh, has meaning to we Midwesterners. I, I love mountains. My wife and I try and get to them at least every other year. The air is so crisp and clean. The, the vistas are breathtaking. We love to hike mountains. Mountains are a good thing, right? Following Jesus leads to good things. Community. Miracles. Power, blessings, just using the, you know, the categories of this text. But you can come up with many others. Following Jesus results in, or leads to, to peace and, and purpose. And he meets our needs and he, he blesses our lives. We could go on and on about the blessings of, of being followers of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Amen, amen. But things suddenly turn. Jesus turns to his disciples. I, I think he's, you know, suspecting they're getting caught up in the hype. And he's got to make some things plain to them. Bonus points if you get that uh, plain thing. This is the Sermon on the Plain, Right? You're familiar with the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. This is similar. Some think it's the same sermon, but probably a different occasion. And rather than on the mountain, they're on a, a level place, a plain. And Jesus makes it plain to, to his disciples what it means to follow him. It's not all fun and games. Following Jesus also leads to valleys. The metaphor used frequently in Scripture, the valley of dry bones in Ezekiel, the valley of uh, Gehenna, place where refuge was burnt, the fire never went out. Sometimes life in the kingdom is hard. Poverty, hunger, Weeping, persecution, we read about those things. It's not even fine print. I mean, this is, this is in the New Testament over and over. They hated me, Jesus said. The world will hate you too. <laughs> you will have trouble in this life. You will be rejected But it's still a blessed life. There are blessings in the valleys too. That's what this whole text is about. It's so bizarre that these things that none of us want to experience are called blessings by Jesus. They're values that we shouldn't run from, we shouldn't avoid at all costs. Maybe not pursue, but let's, let's just unpack this. The blessings of the valleys. How can poverty be a blessing? God loves the poor. That's found in Old Testament and New. They, they have a special place in his heart. Jesus says, when we serve the poor, we serve him. John writes, if, if we don't help out those in need, how can the love of God be in us? But let's make it clear, these are the righteous poor. And there's nothing inherently spiritual about being poor. This whole theological um, strain developed that, in my opinion, is kind of dangerous, called liberation theology. If you're poor, if you're oppressed, then, you know, you're in good with God, just, just because of your social economic status. And, and I, I don't think that's what the Bible teaches. But the righteous poor have a special place in the heart of God. God loves the poor. Because in poverty, we learn to depend on God. It's a good thing when we need his help to get through the day. I know you've heard all of my stories over the last 18 years, but, but this is, this was formative for us. I just taken my first church in Missouri, 
got paid a whopping $300 a week, which was everything. That was housing, that was health insurance, that was, you know, taxes. So we were, you know, at the poverty level, couldn't have, and student loans, I had to pay off my college loans. But thankfully, Tracy had a good job working for Sprint, and we were, we were doing great until she got laid off. <laughs> About the time our first child was born, and she felt, we felt that, you know, she needed to stay home with Grace, and the numbers didn't add up. <laughs> we didn't have a plan. But God provided in miraculous ways. I mean, people just started sending us money. I, I got a check from a high school classmate I hadn't heard from in five years. He had no clue what we were going through. He sent me a check. I'll never forget that when we didn't have, you know, resources of our own and were dependent on God, he was faithful. He provided for us. That's a good thing. We learn dependence. We learn the faithfulness of God. The psalmist declares, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. And earthly poverty, when, you know, we don't have enough and we're kind of always a little stressed out, sure makes heaven look good, doesn't it? There's that element throughout our text we're to look beyond our present trials and troubles and, and consider the, the future that's awaiting us. That's how poverty is a blessing. How about hunger? How can hunger be a blessing? Two words. Weight loss. <laughs> we, we should be hungry more than we are. Shouldn't always reach for the cookie jar, and, and that's what I do when I'm hungry. It's good to be hungry. It's good to feel that ache from time to time. It's good to fast, to willingly go without eating, to identify with those who don't have enough, and to remind ourselves that there's something greater than food. Man does not live by bread alone, Jesus says, during his time of tempting. My food is to do the Father's will, Jesus says. As good as, uh, you know, pizza and chocolate tastes, Jesus is better. One person agrees. He, he meets that deepest hunger within us. Again, he is enough. It's, it's good to be in those situations where unless he shows up, we, we're going to be miserable. Because that's when he shows up. And there's talk in this book about a great banquet. In Revelation, and it's alluded to in the Gospels, the the marriage supper of the Lamb. I can't imagine what, what God's going to spread out before his children on that day. Got to be some peanut butter there, Don. <laughs> There's blessings in hunger. How can weeping be a blessing? And, and I think, you know, you, I think this, you know, includes any time we're in distress, physical pain, or disappointments in life. People have let us down. Family has forsaken us, and, and our hearts are broken. The Bible says God is close to the brokenhearted. It draws near to us when, when our hearts ache, when we're disappointed. But the main benefit, at least, that I wanted you to write down and acknowledge, we live in a, a broken world. There's weeping all around us. And, and when we weep, we gain credibility. We learn how to 
empathize with other weepers. We can enter into the suffering of those who've lost children or been, you know, divorced or had a death of someone near to us or just disappointed. There are lots of people out there to minister to, to give hope to, or just to come alongside and give a hug to. Wounded healers, Henry Nouwen wrote about. We get it. <laughs> We get how hard life can be. We, we can enter into the suffering of a sad, broken world with compassion and love. And joy comes in the morning. There's coming a day when there is no more weeping or suffering or dying or pain. How can persecution be a blessing? There are people, three point, no, I gotta look at the statistic here. 340 million Christians who live in places that have a high level of persecution. Whoops, can you get that for me? <laughs> I dropped stuff last week too. They don't miss, the, miss how startling that is. One in eight Christians face persecution, loss of jobs, loss of freedoms, maybe loss of limbs, loss of life on a daily basis. Thousands were killed last year. Thousands of churches were destroyed. Thousands were arrested last year. And everyone had that great privilege of identifying with Jesus. That's what Peter writes, and, and the Apostle Paul echoes that, to be worthy of suffering for Christ. It's not just generic suffering. It's, it's when our faith has cost us something that means something. And what we've learned throughout history is, is when people suffer and die for the cause of Christ, it, it, it doesn't harm the church. It, it fuels the church. The, the kingdom of God expands. That's, that's why it's spread throughout the world, because people kept trying to hold it back. And we, we learn from our text What blessings await you when people hate you and exclude you and mock you and curse you as evil because you follow Jesus? When that happens, be happy. Yes, leap for joy, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. You want to make sure you make it? Give your life away for the cause of Christ. It'll all be worth it. It'll all be worth it. So the blessings of poverty and hunger and weeping and persecution are there in this life and in the life to come. But how does that help us who, who aren't so poor? We're financially stable. We're, we're well fed, most of us. We're relatively happy popular. I mean, people like us. We're not hated, most of us, most of you. <laughs> what do we do with that? We Americans who really are blessed. I mean, is it a blessing? I, I grapple with that. What's the word for us who can't really identify? Well, maybe our time is coming. I mean, that's one possibility, this is to prepare us for what may be around the corner, who knows, other than God. But three challenges for us. I think we need to evaluate, ask the question, so why am I so blessed? 
Have I been chasing after these things of the world? Is, is that the focus of my life? Because if it is, it's a bit of a problem. What's the cost to affluence, to popularity, to happiness? Have I hoarded my resources and my love? I think a good way to kind of evaluate is look at your checkbooks. Does anyone actually use checkbooks? But, you know, where's your money going? Vacations? Cars? (laughs) Are you bringing the tithe into the storehouse? Why do I enjoy my life so much? Is it because I'm looking out for number one? Or, or, am I just really blessed? Has God just been so good to me? But I think that that merits some consideration because sometimes the enemy allows us to prosper. It's hard to Keep Jesus first when we have money, when we're affluent. A lot of warnings in Scripture about the the danger of wealth, the trap of wealth. But God will bless us if we're faithful. Can't outgive God. If we start giving our money away, God may say, well, I'll keep giving it to you because you know what to do with So that's, if that's the case, if, if you just conclude you've been faithful, you've been obedient, <laughs> then just be thankful. It's kind of this next point. Evaluate, ask the tough questions, and then get busy worshiping. Thank you, God. There shouldn't be a day that goes by that we aren't giving God thanks for our homes and food and our clothing because so many people don't have them. One, now let me get the statistics right, it's in my pocket. 700 million people live on less than $1.90 a day. 3.3 billion, two-fifths of the population on planet Earth live on less than $5.50 a day. One in three don't have access to clean water. You've, you've heard those statistics. They don't have access to education and, and health care, and, and we do. We need to be more grateful. Thank you, God. Help me to steward all you've entrusted me well. I want to come to the end of it all and know that I've been faithful with what you entrusted me. To whom much is given, much is required. So get busy <laughs> giving. The tithe is just the starting point. The minimum. Our financial plan, you know, at this point, we're giving a fourth away. At this point, a third. Um, You know, when the house is paid off, you know, we just have to do that. To steward all that God's entrusted to us. And, And it's fun. It's a great way to live. Holding loosely to the things of this world. Loving. And witnessing. That's how you get persecuted for your faith. You start sharing it with others. Right, VJ? <laughs> you go public, and life may get a little uncomfortable. Of course, we're bullied into believing something that's probably not true, that we can't share our faith in public places. Live on the edge. Have someone call you a, a hater once in a while. Because you're telling them how much Jesus loves them and that he is really the only way to be saved. We have work to do. (laughs) And it may cost us something, but it's a blessed life. And there's great reward. 
And we got to remember that it's all temporary. The things of this world only last, you know, this long. Can't take it with us. It's going to be tested by fire someday. The, the things we've spent so much time and energy on will be tested to see if it was worthwhile. Those who use the things of this world should not become attached to them, for this world as we know it will soon pass away. I've been working on this sermon for three weeks, <laughs> and I'm glad it's over. <laughs> but this is the word of the Lord. So God... May we receive the whole counsel of Scripture, even the parts that get in our face. <laughs> because you love us, Lord, but you love all people. And, and that's kind of the point. We have been saved to do good works. You bless us to bless others. And life is a gift to be enjoyed, but... God, I, I think it's, it's too easy for us to hoard, to prioritize our own happiness and well-being over others. So maybe it was just for me that you wanted me to preach this sermon. <laughs> but remind us that Jesus is that great treasure and if he costs everything we have to possess, he's worth it. <laughs> he's worth it. May we find our joy in loving him and serving him, God. It's better than a new car, a great vacation, a big fish. Lord, help us to live in such a way that you'll say those words to us, well done, good and faithful servants. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, thank you for that word and being obedient this morning, Pastor. Um, I've been here a time or two, I guess I if I would confess, so like, Lord, what... Um, what is it that you expect of me when confronted um, with the truth uh, that your word says? And I, I think about some of the things, uh, you know, Jesus' commandments, uh, come and follow me, go and sin no more, um, sell everything that you have, um, you know, and follow me with the different people that he encountered. And there's many more. And I would encourage you to do that. You know, what, what are Jesus' commandments to his people? Love your neighbor uh, as yourself. There's tons of them that are out there. And a good Google search might help you find some of them. <laughs> but it's like, Lord, what, okay, what do, you, what do you expect of me? And like you said, maybe evaluate. So let's take a moment. Let's take a moment to just do that, to create some space in our, in our mind and, and in our spirit to allow the Holy Spirit to just be honest with us. Like that's tough to do, but it's worth our while. And um, we're going to sing. I'd rather have Jesus um, as a reminder of that. And uh, yeah, let's take a moment and allow the Holy Spirit to speak. Would you stand with me? I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold I'd rather be his than have riches untold I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands and I'd rather by his nail pierced hands than to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway and I'd rather have Jesus
affords today. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you for worshiping with us today and receiving the word. I hope it helps you. I hope you found renewal. If you haven't, stick around for a journey group because it'll be good as we grapple with what the Spirit is saying to us. Let's leave here with some plans, some, some changes we're going to make. So they, they meet throughout our building, and if you don't have a place to gather, join me over in this corner or this side, and, and we'll meet together. Receive the, the blessing from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Go in peace.